UJ and welcome to the introduction to programming in C++. Uh, today we are discussing chapter 1, part 3 of the diverse node mobility front end development program that talks about introduction to computer programming. So here, I'm going to share my screen to you. So let's go to 1.5 as we have, okay, so, okay, so here's the continuation of the chapter 1. So we have character type. Okay, so far we have treated the C++ language as a tool for performing calculations on numbers. This is consistent with the common belief that a computer is just a calculator, albeit a very smart one. You know it's not true, as the computer can be easily used for word processing too. We can define a word as a string of characters. We dealt with such strings in the first lesson when we used C out to write some text on the computer screen. Now, however, we will ignore the string consisting of multiple characters and we will focus our attention on single characters. We will come back to the problem of processing strings when we start working on arrays because in C++ language, all strings are treated as array. Okay. To store the and manipulate characters, the C++ language provides a special type of data. This is this type is called char, which is an abbreviation for the word character. Let us try to declare a variable for storing a single character. Look familiar, doesn't it? Now let us talk a bit about the computer store characters. for Xcode. So computers store characters as numbers. Every character used by computers corresponds to a unique number and vice versa. And there are way more characters than you might ex expect. Many of them are invisible to humans, but essential to computers. Some of these characters are called white spaces, while other are named control characters because their purpose is to control the input or output devices. An example of a white space is, or space that is completely uh, invisible to the naked eye is a special code or a pair of codes that are used to mark the ends of the lines inside text file. Humans don't see these signs but they can see the effect of their application where the lines are broken. We can create virtually any number of character assignments, but a world in which each computer type uses different character encoding would be an extremely convenient world indeed. Computers would not be able to agree on anything and they would not be able to get any work done. A bit like elected politicians, this has led to a need for a universal and widely accepted standard implemented by almost or all computers and operating systems all over the world. So AXI is in short for American Standard Code for Information Interchange, is the most widely used in nearly all modern devices. So like computers, printers, mobile phones, tablets, and etc. use it. The code allows for 256 uh, different characters, but we are only interested in the first 128. If you want to check how the code is constructed, you uh, uh, have to take a look at the table. So here, so this is the table. So this is um, the character decimal number and the hexa, hexadecimal, All right? So um, look at it carefully because there are some interesting things going on here. So let us look at one particular, check out what the code is for the co most common character, the space. Okay, where's the space here? So this decimal um, equivalent for that is 32. Now let's check out what the code is for the lower case of A. So the lower case of A is uh, 97, right? So uh, it's 97. Okay, so and now let us find the upper case of A and it is 65. Now subtract the code for uh, lowercase a from uh, uppercase a and what do you get? 
it is 32. Yes, that's the code for a space. We're going to use the interesting feature of the exit code soon. Also note that the letters are arranged in the same orders as in Latin alphabet. By the way, ACSI code is being superseded by a new international standard named Unicode. Fortunately, the ACSI set is a Unicode subset. Unicode is able to present, represent virtually all characters used throughout the world. We will spend a little more time on this uh, later. Okay, so that is the ACSI code. Okay, the character type values. How do we use values of type char in the C++ language. We can do it in two ways, but both of which are slightly different from each other. The first way allows us to specify the character itself, but includes in single quotes. Let's assume that we want a variable from a few slides earlier to be assigned the value of the uppercase letter A. This is how we do it. So this is uh, the character and then was to a so this is the assignment operator so that means that this variable is equivalent to uppercase a when all we need to do is put a single quotes okay so if you want to use single character on the right side you cannot omit apostrophes under any circumstances if you try the compiler might not like it now let's assign an asterisk to our variable like this so here even if it's um asterisk or any symbol uh, we are going to put apostrophe inside it but there are um some exception to this rule <clears throat> So the second method is to assign a non-negative integer value that is a code of the desired character. That means that the assignment you see on the right will be put on uppercase A into the character variable. This second method, however, is less recommendable and if you avoid it, you should, why you ask? Well, firstly, because it is eligible to humans without knowing that AXI code it is impossible to guess what that 65 really means. It might be a code for a character, but it might equal, equally be that a social fatic programmer has done this to save the number of ship already counted. And secondly, strange but still true, there are significant number of computers in the world which use code other than AXI. For a computer, for example, many of the IBM mainframe use a code commonly commonly called as EBCDIC or stands for uh, Extended Binary Code, the Decimal Interchange Code, which is very different from AXI and is based on radically different concepts. Okay, we think you are ready for a new term, a literal. The literal is a symbol that uniquely identifies its value. Some people prefer to use a different definition the literal means itself choose the definition that you think is clearer and look at the following simple examples so first is character this is not a literal it it is probably a variable name when you look at it you cannot guess what value is currently assigned to that variable so we have capital uh, it is uppercase a this is a literal when you look at it you may you immediately know it is a value you even know that it is a literal of chart type. So we have 100. It is also a literal in a type int. So we have uh, 100.0. It is another literal, this time of the float type. And we have i plus 100. This is a combination of a variable and a literal joined together with a plus operator. Such a structure is called an expression. So that is what we call expression. Okay, if you are an inquisitive person, you have probably asking this question if a literal of type char is given as the character includes in apostrophes. How do you code the apostrophe itself? The C++ language uses a special convention that also extends to other characters, not only to apostrophes, but to start with an apostrophe anyway. An apostrophe look like this. So um, all we need to do is enclose them, the apostrophe. This is the original 
apostrophe and then we have the uh, single apostrophe the, the pair of apostrophe here and all we need to do is put a backslash before uh, typing the apostrophe itself so the backslash character acts as so-called escape character because by using backslash we escape from the normal meaning of the character that follows the slash in this example we skip from the usual role of the apostrophe which is delimiting the literals of a type tar and the apostrophe that follows the backslash is simply an apostrophe character so you can also use the escape character to escape from escape character so this is how we put a backslash into a variable of type char so we are going to add another backslash here okay so since um then the um the value of the character is only a single backslash because this on the first backslash this is only an escape character okay so the c plus plus language also allows us to escape in some other circumstances let us start with those that denote literals representing white spaces which is uh, backslash n denotes a transition to a new line and is sometimes called lf for instance for line feed as printers react to this character by moving the paper forward by one line of the text. How about backslash R? So this denotes a uh, return to the beginning of the line and is sometimes called CR or carriage return. Carriage was the synonym of the print head in the pre-digital times. And printers respond to this character as if they have been told to restart printing from the left margin of the already printed line. To make a printer start printing a new line, you have to send those two characters in a particular order, LF to eject the paper and CR to move the head to the beginning of the new line. So we have backslash A as in alarm is a relic of the past when teletypes were often used to communicate with computers. Sending this character a tele teletype turns on its ringer. Hence, the character is officially called Bell, as Bell. If you send this character to the string, you will hear a sound. It won't be a real ringing, but, shall, but rather a short beep. The power of tradition persists even in the IT world. So how about backslash zero? Note that the character after the backslash is a zero, not, an, uh, not a capital O. So this is called null. From the Latin word nullus means none. Is a character that does not represent any character, despite first impressions that it might be very helpful or useful. Now, let us try to escape in a slightly different direction. The first example explains a variant when a backslash is followed by two or three octal digits. The number coded in this manner will be treated as an active value, and it may look like this. 47 is octal, and this 39 is a decimal. So look at the Xcode table, and you will find that it is the exit code for apostrophe, so that this is equivalent to backslash. Or uh, this is apostrophe, since uh, the backslash is for escape, and this one is to delimit the string, and this is the real value, which is a single apostrophe. The second escape refers to the situation that backslash is followed by the letter X. Lowercase or uppercase, it doesn't matter. So here we need either one or two hexadecimal digits, which we will be treated as Xcode. Here is the example, as you have probably guessed, 27 is a hexadecimal and 39 is the decimal. 
So there is an assumption in the C++ language that may seem surprising at first. The char type is treated as a special kind of int type. This means that you can always assign a char value to an int variable. You can always assign an int value to a char variable, but if you val if the value exceeds 127, you will get a loss of value. Then, value of the chart type can be subject to the same operators as the data of ty type int. So, uh, this is integer. So, we can check this by using a simple example. We said earlier that in Axie, the distance between upper and lower case letter is 32. And that 32 is also the code of the space character. Look at the snippet. So this sequence of subsequent addition and subtraction will bring the char value to its original value, which is uppercase A. Can you see why? If not, don't worry, and all will become clear soon enough. Okay, so all of the assignments on the right are correct try to figure out their meanings so here we have a capital of a my plus 32 and then a uh, 32 is equals to space right in axi code and 65 is equivalent to small letter a and 97 is equivalent to uppercase a So we are done. Here are the numbers 97, 97, 65, 65. Uh huh. This is all right. So a programmer writes a program and the program asks a question. A computer executes the program and provides the answer. The program must be able to react according to the received as answers fortunately the computer knows only two kinds of answer yes this is true and no this is false you will never get a response like i don't know or probably yes but i don't know for sure if you do receive these answers then consult your therapist about them uh, to ask questions the c++ language uses a set of very special operators we will list them one after another illustrating their effects on some simple examples so by the way guys we are already on 1.6 and this talks about a flow control how to make simple decision okay so question is x equals to y questions are so the question is are two values equal to ask this question you use equal equal operator but do not forget this is important distinction equal is an assignment operator and equals equal is the question for are this value equal okay so it is a binary operator with a left side binding if needs two arguments and checks it needs two arguments and checks if they are equal now let us, let us ask a few questions and try to guess the answer so the question is trivial Trivial. Of course, 2 is equals to 2. The computer will answer true. This one is trivial too. So the answer will be false. Okay, so because this is uh, definitely 1 is equals equals to 2, our different value, right? Okay, so here are we not to find the answer if we don't know what value is currently stored in variable i. So if the variable has been changed many times during the execution of your program, the answer to this question can be only given can be given only by the computer and only at the runtime. So the value of the i will be only executed or will be known after the execution of the program or the code. So here we have another developer who counts black and white ships separately and can only fall asleep when there are exactly twice as many black sheep as white. So the question is as follows. So if you read this, black sheep is equals equals to two t 
times white sheep counter. So due to the low priority of equal equal operator, this question is treated as equivalent to this one. Black sheep counter equals equals, then we have parenthesis two times uh, white sheep counter. To ask this question, we use not, uh, this is exclamation, then equal. It is very close relative of the equal equal operator. It is also a binary operator and has same low priority. Imagine we want to ask whether the number of days left to the end of the world is currently not equal to zero. If the answer is true, that gives us the chance to go to the theater or visit our friends. If the answer is false, well, that is it. So on how to do that, then this is read as is not equal to zero. So exclamation is a stands for not. So you can ask this question using greater operator. If you want to know that there are more black sheep than white ones, you can write it as follows. So the true answer confirms false answer denies. So the greater operator has another special non-strict variant, but it is noted differently than in the classical arithmetic notation which is greater equal so these are two subsequent characters not one so both of these operators strict and non-strict as well as the another two we mentioned in the next section are binary operators with left side binding and their priority is greater than the one shown by equal equal and not equal if we want to find out whether or not we can leave our warm hat at home. We ask the following question. So centigrade outside is greater than or equal to 0, 0.0. As you have probably already surmised, the operators we are using in this case are less operator or less than operator and it is non-strict sibling of less than equal Operator. So look at this example, simple example. We are going to check if there is a risk that we will be fined by the highway police. Okay, so here, current velocity less than 110 or um, current velocity is less than or equals to 110. So how do we use the answer we got? What can we do with the answer the computer has given us? Well, we have at least two options. First, we can memorize it or store it in a variable and make use of it later. So how we do that? Well, we use an arbitrary variable of type int like this here. Um, if the answer is true because value one is greater then or equals to value two, the computer will assign one to answer variable. If value one variable is less than var value two variable, the variable answer will be zero. So the second option is more convenient and far more common. We can use the answer to make a decision about the future of our program. We use the special instruction for this purpose and we will go it to it to very soon uh, but now here's the updated priority table it now looks like this so here so as we have said that uh, equal equal and not equal also this is all binary uh, are having a lower priority okay so as you can see in the, the updated priority table it was um, listed uh, in the lower level the conditions and conditional executions we already know how to ask but we still don't know how to make reasonable use of answers we need a mechanism to allow us to do something if a condition is met and not to do it otherwise so we already know how to ask but we still don't know how to make 
reasonable use of the answer. So we need a mechanism to allow us to do something if a condition is met and not to do if it otherwise. It is just like in real life, we do certain things or we don't when a specific condition is met or not. So we go for a walk if the weather is good or we stay home if it not, is not. To make this decisions, the C++ language offers us the special instruction due to its nature and its application, and it is called a conditional instruction. So there are several variants of it. So we will start with the uh, simplest one and work our way up to the hardest one. Harder one. The first form of the conditional statement, which you can see on the right, is written very informally, but uh, figuratively. So the conditional statement consists of the following strictly necessary elements in this and only this order. So we have if keyword here in the left opening parenthesis, an expression or a question or an answer. This value will be interpreted solely in the terms of true when its value is non-zero and false when it is equal to zero. And right, which is closing in parenthesis here, and the instruction an instruction so only one but we will learn uh, how to deal with that uh, limitation so how does that statement work if the true or not expression includes in inside the parenthesis represent this truth the statement behind this condition will be executed so if the true or not uh, expression represents the falsehood the statement behind the condition is omitted and the next instruction executed will be the one after the conditional statement so that is the if a sta conditional statement work. So in real life, we often express a will. If the weather is good, we will go for a walk and next we will have lunch. Thankfully, having lunch is not a conditional activity and doesn't depend on the weather. Knowing what conditions influence our behavior and assuming that we have parameterless functions. For example, for go for a walk and have lunch, we can write the following statement. So here we have an if statement here. So here we have if the weather is good, then go for a walk. Then we will have also lunch. So whether if it is uh, true or false, then we will have lunch. But this uh, in this part, we will depend if it is true or false, then we are going to execute it. So now back to our friend, the programmer who falls asleep when he counts 120 sheep. The sleeping is implemented a special function named sleep and dream. So this function does not require any parameters. So we can read it as if, if sheep counter is greater than or equal to 120, then fall asleep and dream. So we said that there can be only one statement after the if statement when we have to execute conditionally more than one instruction. We need to use the curly braces and which uh, create structure known as compound statement or a block. The compiler treats the block, block as a single instruction. So this is how we can use the circumvent the uh, statement limitation so let us be a little nicer to our programmer so here we have a block this is the opening and closing so now it's time to uh, for some sty stylistic remarks writing out the blocks like the previous Example is, of course, syntactically correct, but very inelegant. It may cause the text of our program to run outside the right margin of the editor. There are several ways to code the blocks. We won't try to argue, but some are better than others. But we are going to use the K and R style. The letters K and R are the initial of the creator of the C language, which is Mr. Kernigan and Mr. Ritchie. They use this style in the articles, and we think it is prudent to follow them. The same snippet uh, written in accordance with KNR style look like this. So all we need to do is uh, left the opening uh, bracket here, and going to indent if it is enclosed with a block. So a tab here, or indented, indented, indented. So 
this okay know that the conditional executed block is indented indented it is uh improve the readability of the program and manifest its conditional nature right so in the next section we are going to discuss another variant of the conditional statement which also allows you to perform an action only when the condition is not met so now feed your trip dogs please and you have been awaiting for so long that you are starting to eye slip so let us read this uh, code so if ship carrier is greater than or equals to 120 then make a bed take a shower and sleep a dream and whether the condition that condition is true or false then feed the ship dogs Okay, so now let's go to 1.7. So it talks about connecting with the real world input and output. So let us spend some time on two important, extremely useful features that we can use to connect the computer with the outside world. When data moves in the direction of human or the user, the computer program, it is called the input. The data transferred in the opposite direction from the computer to human is called output. We have already learned about one useful entity that serves the output to uh, to data to output data. Can you remember its name? Yep, it is the C out stream, and we use it along with this. Um, uh, this is angle angle bracket operator in the very first program we wrote in the C++ language right at the beginning of this course. So the angle bracket operator, the double angle bracket operator itself is sometimes referred to as an insertion, insertion operator. So as it inserts a string of characters into the character device or a console, for example, console. So the actual C out capabilities are more impressive. It is uh, capable of writing the data of virtually of virtually any type on a computer screen. So what do we do if we want to output the value of type int or float or char? Um, not only a simple string. To do this, and other more complex tasks, we need to use any of the output streams associated with the screen and send a value of a variable there. Cout is one of these streams and is ready to work without any special preparations. It only needs the header file name. If you want to print the value of an integer variable to the screen, the only thing you have to do is send to the Cout stream through the uh, bracket operator. So this is angle bracket operator. So which indicates the desired direction of the data transfer. But the angle bracket operator and the C out stream are responsible for uh, two important actions. So first is uh, converting the internal, which is the machine representation of the integer value into the form acceptable for humans. And second one is transferring the converting form to the output device, for example, console. So streams are very powerful and convenient tools for both input and output. They can be easily output several values of different types and mix them with the text. Okay, so they can also easily input many values at once. So let us look at the stream in a few applications. The first one is trivia. Trivial. Uh, we use C to print a value of an int variable. We do it like this. So we have int heard underscore size so that is a variable name that is equals to 110 and we have c out which is the insertion operator okay so we have heard underscore size so we can expect is expect that a string consisting of characters one and one and zero will appear in the screen immediately one one zero okay so you can also connect more than one um more than one angle bracket operator is one of the c out statement and each of the printed uh element may be out of may be of a different type and different nature take a look at the example on the right we are go we are using a little string literal 
and an integer variable and in one C out operation. In this example, in third underscore size is equals to one, two, three, and we have C out and then in go bracket. So this is less than less than, right? So ship counted so far and then includes by double coded. And then we have the variable and in order for us to add the arguments or the variable name, then we are going to add another angle bracket. Okay, so in C out, uh, I mean in C, in the programming language C, we are going to use print F, while in C++ we are going to use C out. So this is snippet of code results in the string uh, counted, then 1, to 3 printed on screen. So this would be the expected output. Okay, so an expression is a legal C at element two. The element, the example on the right demonstrate one such case. So here we have the expression as the argument here. So as you can see, we have four times uh, square underscore side. So what do you think is the answer? So what uh, um, the square parameter is 12 times four, which is equivalent to 48. So that would be the answer. So if you want to, uh, if you want a value of type in to be presented as a fixed point hexadecimal number, you need to use the so-called manipulator. A manipulator is a special kind of entity that tells the stream that the data form has to be changed immediately. All elements outputted after the manipulator activation will be presented in the desired form. A manipulator that is designed to switch the stream into hexadecimal mode is called a hex. The snippet of on the right will output a string consisting of the characters f and f. Technically, a manipulator is a function that changes one of the output stream's property called base field. The property is used to determine what a number should be used as a base during the conversion of any int value into, into the human readable text. So there are two important facts as you need to understand here. Any manipulator starts its work from the point is was placed at and continues its work even after the end of the cout statement. It finishes working only when another manipulator cancels its action. So the second one is uh, the name of the manipulator may be conflict with the with any other name declared by the programmer. Example, uh, you can have your own variable name hex hex, which could hide the manipulator's name. Such conflicts are resolved by a specialized mechanism called namespace. More on this later. So the example on the right demonstrates how the manipulators begin and finish their work. So note that the DEC or decimal manipulator switches the stream into the decimal form. We don't have it explicitly in most cases. So since the decimal is the default working mode for output streams, the snippet will output three specimens of the same value, which is FF as a hexadecimal representation of 255. And FF again, the previous hex activation is still working here, and 255 as a result of the decimal manipulator activation. So the OCT or octal manipulator switches the stream into the octal mode. The snippet on the right will output 377 to the screen. Can you guess why? Yes, 255 is decimal and 377 is octal. Well done. So the three manipulators we've shown you previously are only one of the methods of accessing the base field property. You can achieve the same effect by using the set base manipulator, which directly instructs the stream on what base value it should, it should use during conversion. So the only acceptable values for the set parameter are 8, 10, 16. Hopefully you got the purpose of the tree manipulators. If not, go back and look at them a little longer. It will come to you eventually, and we hope. So the program on the right demonstrates the usage of the set base manipulator. So note that it requires a header file called IO manip. So it stands for input output manipulators.
So after the hash include io stream, then hash include io manip, add that in the header file, and then we are going to use this using namesake, namespace std, then in int, this is the main function, int main void, and then we have declare the int, then the name of our Okay, so that is byte and equals to 255. So we have C out and set base 16, which is equivalent to hexadecimal, right? Okay, so. Okay, so in general, the output streams, including C out, are able to recognize the type of printed value and act accordingly. They will use a proper form of data representation for char and float values. The snippet on the right will cause the stream to print the following text on the screen. Okay, so that probably the answer would be x and uh, then dash 2.5. Because, so I, because char is equivalent to x and then minus is equivalent to dash or yeah, and then float is equivalent to the value of 2.5 so C out is available to recognize the actual type of its element even when it is an effect of a conversion we will discuss the conver conversion later but for now we only when want to mention what that a phrase written as new type and expression so here changes the type of the X or the XPR expression into the new type type. What it means is that we can see the hexacode of any character stored within a char variable and vice versa, or see a character whose hexacode is placed inside an int variable. The snippet on the right outputs the following text to the screen. Okay, so we have X, then we have 8, 8, and then another 8, 8, and then X. Okay, so sometimes you may want to break the line being sent to the screen. When we present many different results one by one in the same line of text, it doesn't look nice and you won't want to look at it. One line is okay, but a thousand lines written like that will make you go blind. So we can um, break the lines in two ways. First, you can use one of the control uh, character called new line and the code is uh, backslash n and the new line character forces the console to complete the current line in to start a new line so we need we can achieve exactly the same effect by using manipulator called and l so this is end line so the snippet on the right illustrate both methods and causes the console to display the following three lines of the text so here as you can see this is the value one so we are going to uh, have the new line here so the two will become to the second line and since we although we don't have the backslash n but we have and l but it have only the same effect it will have the same effect so uh, one to three so the expected output will be here this is one so the output string streams try to output float values in a form that is more compact and a decision is taken for every printed float value for example the following sniff snippet float x is equals to 2.5 then y is equals to 0 0.00000025 to see out then angle bracket x and l and then angle bracket y angle bracket and l so we'll produce the following output on the screen, which is 2.5 and then 2.5 exponent, then negative 009. So the former is referred to the fixed point, while the latter as a scientific. There are two manipulators designed implicitly to choose the desired output depending on the user's needs and preferences. Their names are fixed and scientific. Note that in that the initial the streams are set neither to the fixed nor to the scientific mode, but to the default is is automatic mode. Using any of the above manipulators switches the stream to the desired mode. However, you cannot turn to the default method of processing floats by using any of the manipulators.
So we, you have to use the special function, but we are going to intentionally not going to talk about this here. So the program the right will output the following text. Okay, so as you can see, we have a fix. And then um, it is equals to 2.5. So we choose a manipulator first, which is fixed. Okay, so it will just uh, give us the result 2.5, then this one. And then, so, we, so since we choose scientific manipulator, then it will give us the result this one all right so that is the difference between fixed and um scientific okay so of course equally important as data output is data input actually it is uh different to imagine any non-trivial program that doesn't require any data from the user although you can do the following encode all the data needed inside the source code and second when you need to repeat the execution of the program with other data, you just modify the program, compile it, and run it again. So this is not a particular convenient solution. It is far better to get the information from the user, transfer it to the program, and then use it for calculations. So how does a C++ language program get data from a human and store it in a volume, uh, in variables? The simplest way is the mental reverse uh, direction of the of the transfer and to acknowledge that for the data input so we can use c in stream instead of c out so we can use um less than less than operator instead of greater greater than operator by the way that uh less than less than operator is often referred to as an extraction operator so this one is insertion insertion operator and this one is extraction operator so the c in stream along with the extraction operator is responsible for two two um two things first is transferring the human readable form to the data from the input device second converting the data into the internal representation of the value being input so imagine that we want to ask the user about the maximum number of sheep we want to count before the programming falls asleep. The user uh, enters the value from the keyboard and the program st stores it in a specified variable, which is max sheep. That statement looks like this. So you probably see the similarity to emitting data using C at. We have a stream, we have an operator, and we have a variable. At this point, the similarities ends and the differences begin. First, the argument for C out may not be a variable. It can be also an expression. Take a look. So we have C out and then 2 times I. So here we want to double value of I to be printed and that is feasible using an input stream. We need to explicitly uh, specify the variable that, we, that can store the data entered by the user. Okay, so now we will show you a simple but complete program that does not does the following. First, it prompts the user to enter a single integer value and squares it. And next, prints the result of the appropriate a comment. Analyzing this program should not be your problem for you, for you, we hope. So in this source code, if you're going to click this, then it will prompt you to uh, downloading a file, then the file will contain this code so if you are going to um, run this code then it will give you a number and so it will give you this one give me a number and square it so after that after you after the user then the user will input something then this is how we manage them or the um, the program for that or the command for that and after that it will be squared by using this expression and then the system will give us this number you've given for example a two okay for you've given two and then an end line or the new line and then it will give you the result the squared value is four
Okay, so you prefer square roots to squares, no problem, but we need to remember two things. First, there's no such thing as a square root operator, and second, that, that square roots of negative numbers do not exist. So we can solve the first issue by finding a function that knows how to compute the root. This type of function does not exist in text argument of the float type. The result is also a float. Of course, the square of an integer is still an integer, but the root any number is not always an integer like the root of 2. So it can be float. Okay, so the function we are going to use is called SQRTF, stands for square root float, and needs exactly one argument or oh, one more thing to use this function you need to include the header file name cmat so we need to deal with the negative numbers as well if you are careless and enter a negative number the program will just ignore you and your input completely it may not be polite but at least it won't attempt to bend the rules of mathematics whether you see the whether you, we see the result or not will be declined by the conditional statement. Now it's time to focus on the use of floating point data and the SQRT function. So here is the program. So just like here, okay, so if you're going to um, download this one, just right click and then tap link address or just click it to prompt you to save the file okay so inside that file this will contain this um this will contain this code and as you can see we are going to the task is to give me a number and we, we, are, we are going to square it and for now um after squaring it then we're going to use cmat because uh, the function sqrt is a square root float so now okay so we have declared a value of uh, value variable and square root variable and now the system will give us give me a number and i will find its square root then um c in then the human will or the user will enter the value after that we have also include here an if uh, if conditional statement which is the value is greater than or equals to 0, 0.0 then if it is true then it will execute the block which is the square root is equals to sqrt which is square root float then the value so it will give us the result you have given then the value for example 2 then c, uh, c out then the square root is square root so the square root is equals so the expression is here so this question was uh, declared here in the section all right so guys we are going to Okay, answer this a module one quiz. So this quiz will help up to prepare for module one test. You will be have twenty five minutes to answer ten questions, and you will be submit. Uh, will be able to see the correct answer after you submit each question. You are free to take the quiz as many times as you like. So good luck, guys! And if you like to few second for the quiz to load. Okay, so this is um still loading so you're going to wait this so now guys that is all for this um session so chapter one part three so that concludes the chapter one uh part three of the diverse node mobility front end program please answer the uh, chapter one quiz and chapter one tests so have have a good day and good luck to your quiz.